Good evening. My name is Roger Wick, and I'm the Melvin R. Seedon Curator and Department Head of Medieval and Renaissance Manuscripts here at the Morgan Library. But more pertinent tonight, I am the curator of the curator version of the Book of Ruth, a medieval to modern that's on view upstairs in the cube. Tonight, um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then Barbara, the artist, of the combination is also then going to speak for about 10 minutes. Then we're going to sit down and have a conversation and ask each other some questions. And then after that, we'll open the floor up to questions from you, the, the audience, okay. So the Book of Ruth, Medieval to Modern, is a small exhibition that celebrates the donation in 2018 to the Morgan of the Joanna S. Rose Illuminated Book of Ruth, or shortened sometimes to the Rose Book of Ruth, which is a manuscript, a 21st century manuscript that is the creation of Barbara Wolf, the artist who will be joining us tonight. Um, this joins two other manuscripts that are also creations of Barbara Wolf, also the gift of Joanna S. Rose, for which we had an exhibition in 2015 that some of you might remember, Hebrew Illumination for Our Time, The Art of Barbara Wolf. So this is the ex second exhibition that we've had of our living artist, Barbara Wolf. When Joanna gave us the Book of Ruth, uh, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, it would be nice to do an exhibition to celebrate this gift in the manner with which we did the 2015 show. Um, so I started thinking, what do we have that illustrates the Book of Ruth? Because Ruth, as a biblical book and as a historic person, was completely off my radar screen. I knew next to nothing um, about Ruth. So I started doing some searching in the manuscripts and found out that actually we had a good deal of manuscripts that illustrate the story of the Book of Ruth. Uh, about 24 in number, so I could have filled the cube twice over. Uh, in doing my research, I found that there were two medieval traditions for illustrating the Book of Ruth. Now, in 13th and 14th century Bibles or other texts, such as Bible Historial, the French translation with added stuff of the Bible, the Book of Ruth, like almost every other book of the Bible, only gets one picture, all right? But in the first, most popular tradition, uh, I saw this, which is an example on the screen, which shows Naomi with her husband, Elimelech, and their two children leaving Judea because of famine. Now, I will backtrack by giving a short, uh, short story version of the story of Ruth. So, Naomi and her husband and children leave Judea because of famine. They go to the land of Moab. Her two sons grow up and marry two Moabite women. Everything is good and happy until tragedy strikes and all the men of the family die, uh, Naomi's husband and the two sons. So, Naomi is left in a kind of foreign country, Moab, and she says to her daughters-in-law, I need to go back to my people back in Judea, but you stay here, you're young, you're here, you can marry other husbands. And the one daughter-in-law, Orpah, says, okay, you're right, and she leaves. But Ruth turns to her mother-in-law and says, no, I cling to you, I will not leave you. And in the famous line as part of the story, she says, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. So. Naomi returns to Judea with Ruth, and now the tables are turned, and Ruth is the foreigner in a foreign and strange land. So the story of Ruth touches on many timely elements today, emigration and immigration and famine and outsiderness and the position of women in a male-dominated society. The story continues in that Ruth meets a man, a wealthy man named Boaz, and gleans in his field. And uh, she tells Naomi what she did, and Naomi says, oh, that's very interesting because actually that man is a relative of yours through your dead husband. And uh, I've got more of the story, but I'll continue because I've got some pictures to come. So, the first tradition actually illustrates the departure of Naomi and her husband and two children from Judea. 
And in this 13th century depiction, you can see how the famine is suggested by that barren, rocky, unhospitable landscape over which the four people have to walk to leave the famine-stricken land of Judea. This is another example of the departure, or a little bit the family has actually entered into the area, the land around Moab. And you see that there are some trees which have fruit on them, grass on the ground, and some water with uh, fresh flowing water. So they've arrived into the rich land. But something that might strike you, the 21st century viewers, as a little bit unusual, in that the Book of Ruth, as is the tradition that I mentioned, only gets one picture, but the woman who is named after the book is literally out of the picture. She's not to be seen. And that's because there was a tradition in the Middle Ages to, when there was not a long iconographic tradition at hand, to have the artist read the beginning of the story, or have it read to them if they were illiterate, and illustrate whatever narrative comes up in the opening lines. And that's what this tradition partakes of, because the narrative begins, was, begins with, there was famine in the land, and Naomi and her husband and children had to leave. There is a second tradition, which is a little bit more to be expected, I think, by our eyes today, and that is, illustrated by this 13th century French Bible, and it shows Ruth with the grain that she has gleaned from Boaz's field, returning to Naomi. Naomi is sometimes depicted and sometimes not, and in this one she's not. But I want you to notice the heads of those people on the windows above Ruth. Now, this is a very small picture. Most of you, I see, have the brochure, so you've seen the exhibition. So you know how small and slender this picture is. Those heads looking out of those windows are about the size of erasers. They're really small, but the artist has packed into them with a little tip of the pen and a little stroke here, the suspicion, the wariness, and the leeriness with which these Judeans are looking down out of their windows asking themselves, who is this woman? Oh, that's that stranger, that's that Moabite. Hmm, we don't know about her. But in the Middle Ages, artists could go outside the envelope and do other things. They didn't have to follow the two main traditions. And in this particular English 13th century Bible, the artist decided to illustrate the kind of meet cute between Ruth and Boaz. So there you see Boaz on the left, and he's got a kind of rod, which is symbolic of his authority. And the woman in the middle is Ruth. She's got a nice hat on, and she's asking him if she can glean in her fields. And the guy on the right leaning over is one of the reapers. It's interesting in reading the story of Ruth that it was a tradition at the time that the women and the poor could glean, and they actually didn't have to ask permission. But her asking Boaz, her speaking with Boaz, is Ruth's beginning to be proactive with her future and her fate. And that is also one of the themes that runs through the book of Ruth. In this 14th century Bible that's huge, uh, from bo probably Bohemia, uh, we see the happy conclusion of the trying events, and that is Ruth in bed with Boaz, and it's their marriage bed. Um, I had one of the visitors ask me about that little curtain that you see uh, that's on the top of the miniature, and that's not there because the scene is a, pe a couple in bed. It's a little curtain to protect the painting surface so it doesn't become abraded when those very heavy pages are turned. And then there's this manuscript. I know all of you in this audience are familiar with our very famous book called the Crusader Bible a beautiful picture book that was made in the middle of the 13th century, most probably for King Louis IX, later Saint Louis. And it has an amazing 16 scenes to illustrate the Book of Ruth. So it's a total outlier in terms of the tradition of one picture for Ruth. In this scene, this is the scene we've seen before, which is when Ruth and Boaz first meet. And there is Boaz saying, oh yes, you're allowed to glean. He's pointing over here, and here's Ruth. And then here are the reapers that she's going to 
follow when she does her gleaning. And then Boaz takes a tiny step forward, and after the gleaning, he invites Ruth to have a meal with him. So there he is, and there she is seated. This huge pile of barley sheaves is representative of how wealthy Boaz is. So after Ruth does her gleaning and her threshing, she goes back to Naomi with her, her, her abundance of food. And this is then where Naomi counsels her. And I left off on the story earlier, but I'll continue it. And when uh, Ruth says, I was in the field of Boaz, Naomi says, ah, you related to him. Take a bath, put on some perfume, and put on your best clothing, and when the sun sets, go to Boaz's tent and lie down at his feet. Here are the men threshing, continuing the work, and here is Ruth who is lying down at the feet of Boaz as he's sleeping on his sheaves of barley. Lie down at his feet. The medieval artist who illustrated this episode picked up on the implications that are not explicit in the story, but are hinted at. The fact that this thresher is a young man with a very muscular back and he's doing his work in his underwear is not an accident. And notice the very suggestively positioned basket of seeds which are flying up from this man here. So um, that was their expression of what they thought was going to take place in that tent. The conclusion of the story sees Ruth in bed pointing to Naomi, her mother-in-law, who's cuddling her son, uh, Obed, and the women of Judea join. They join the scene, and they're very prescient because they congratulate Naomi and Ruth for giving birth to a son who's going to be the father of Jesse, who's going to be the father of David. Ruth plays a very important role in the genealogy, as I've just mentioned, of King David. If it hadn't been for Ruth and her meeting Boaz, there would be no David. So in the Jewish tradition, she's very important here. And also in genealogy, in gene, her genealogical role for Christians is also stressed and important because Jesus Christ, the Savior, is descendant from the house of David. And that's illustrated in what's called the iconography of the tree of Jesse, and that's illustrated in this uh, 11th century, sorry, 12th century Psalter uh, leaf here. That's one of the final items in the exhibition. So, I spoke of the medieval component, and now uh, I invite the artist Barbara Wolf to come up and tell you about her creation. manuscripts that I have never seen before. So thank you so much. The question I needed to ask myself at the start of my artist journey with Naomi and Ruth was, where will my inspiration for picturing their story come from? After all, there is no medieval and Renaissance Hebrew manuscript tradition of illustrating the Book of Ruth. After much research, I found only one illuminated manuscript and a single drawing of Ruth gleaning. Instead, there is a vast and ancient tradition of rabbinic commentary, biblical responsa, and folklore relating to this seemingly simple story. A story read in the synagogue each year at the spring harvest festival of Shavuot. This commentary touches on all areas of civil society 
and communal life. So I made a decision not to simply retell the story, but to engage with the text itself, to look behind the words and to see beyond them. Thus, on the Hebrew side of this manuscript, the viewer will find visual reminders of that commentary. Thistles, a sandal, architectural outlines, and cylinder seals. And on the English side, I have created pen and ink drawings that set the scene for the story of Ruth and Naomi. A small hill town in early Iron Age Israel and the domestic lives of its inhabitants. Their surroundings, their occupations, their customs and tools. The Book of Ruth begins with a phrase repeated for thousands of years. There was famine in the land. These are words that reflect the precarious climate of the Middle East. Famine, preceded by drought, has again and again toppled empires and sent entire populations in search of food. Quote, there was another famine in the land besides the famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went unto Gerar. The famine was all over the face of the earth, so they took their livestock and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him, end quote. And later, from the Bronze Age empires of the Hittites, Egypt, and the cities of Hattusa and Ugarit in a time of hunger and terror. Quote, there was famine in your house and no grain in the land. The living soul of your country you will see no longer. It is a matter of life or death, end quote. The cries of help resound even to the present. From the 2008 United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, quote, drought is increasing. We don't have time to lose. We must act now, end quote. And from 2013, from the UN Office of Disaster Reduction, after 10 years of drought in Syria, Drought is spreading like cancer. What would describe the impact of those despairing opening words as Elimelech, Ruth, and their children fled Beit Lechem for sustenance and safety in Moab? In my mind's eye, I saw the dry fields in Israel at the end of summer where there hasn't been a drop of rain for six months. There, fierce armies of bleached white thistles stand girded with terrible thorns. It is an enduring image of drought. My choice was that thistle, a noxious weed of fallow fields and desolate places. I used platinum here rather than silver for its hard, mirror-bright effect. Quote, and the woman was left of her two children and her husband, end quote. Five Hebrew words are all that are needed to describe this scene of sheer hopelessness. Naomi is widowed destitute and so utterly alone that the Hebrew text calls her leftover, a remnant. She seems abandoned by life, but the unfolding narrative reveals otherwise. Naomi and Ruth survive. Their courage and resilience will create a different outcome 
than what those dire words suggest. The caper bush is native to Israel, growing wild almost everywhere. And like Naomi and Ruth, it is a survivor. Its ability to take root and thrive in barren dry rocks, splitting them open, was commented on by third century rabbinic sages. They called it the persevering among trees. Resilience and perseverance, assets which make the caper bush a compelling symbol in the face of great odds, are the same qualities which foretell the future of Naomi and Ruth. The ripe wheat has been cut. Now it must be threshed, the stalks crushed to release the grain. And Ruth and Boaz meet again, this time in darkness on the threshing floor of Beit Lehem, where events will change the direction of the narrative. There are many references to threshing floors in biblical literature, some literal, others symbolic. In prophecy, they're symbols of judgment where biblical events have occurred on or near them. The event that inspired this illumination was a plague sent by God as a punishment for David's disobedience. When the plague ceased, David was ordered by God to buy a threshing floor and build a sacrificial altar there. It was on that site that Solomon, David's son, later built the Jerusalem temple. So for me, it was just a short distance from that threshing floor to an ancient manuscript by the great 12th century philosopher Maimonides. In that manuscript, Maimonides created a diagram outlining the shape and structure of that long gone building. Here, the Maimonides temple outline in red, blue, purple, and gold has become Beit Lechem's threshing floor. The image of God's wing is a metaphor for protection in the Bible. In the book of Ruth, Boaz hopes that God will provide for Ruth since she has come to take refuge under his wings. With similar words, Ruth entreats Boaz for shelter by asking him to spread his wing over her. But the Hebrew word for wing, kanaf, in addition to implying God's refuge, has acquired several other meanings. It can also mean the edge or corner of a garment. And this definition has led commentators to interpret a scene at the heart of this story quite differently. That scene, a threshing floor at midnight, outside the city, released from constraints and charged with sexual innuendo, is filled with mystery and double meanings. The situation is fraught with danger for Ruth, and both reader and commentator are left to ponder. What drove Naomi and Ruth? Was it desperation? or faith, what was asked for and what was given, protection, redemption, marriage, responsibility. I chose to picture the literal definition of kanaf, wing, and lead the reader to tease out their own metaphor. Very little is known about wedding customs in ancient Iron Age Israel. But from the text in the Book of Ruth, we can surmise that Boaz's public statement of intent with the people of Beit Lechem as witnesses most likely comprised the entire marriage ceremony. 
The community blesses Boaz's declaration that he intends to take Ruth as his wife. And this honors Ruth and links her with Rachel and Leah, matriarchs of Israel. Ruth's ornate girdle is based on the festive clothing of Bedouin and Yemenite women, both ancient and modern. Their brightly woven wedding belts are sewn with hammered silver ornaments, tinkling silver bells, colored beads, and cowrie shell amulets to ensure fertility and as potent shields against the evil eye. Quote, she bore a son, and they called him Obed, end quote. The wedding blessing of the community, a child to renew Naomi's broken family lineage, has been fulfilled with the birth of a son to Ruth and Boaz. In the remains of ancient cities, archaeologists have found durable children's playthings, such as balls, clay figures, models of chariots, and pull toys in the form of various animals. One might imagine the child Obed playing with one of them. I have chosen to picture here a charming toy, a wheeled bird with a ram's head. And to conclude the book of Ruth, Obed was to become the father of Jesse and the grandfather of King David. Thank you. So now Barbara and I are going to have a conversation. She will ask me a couple of questions. I will ask her some, and we'll explore some of the themes of which we've touched on lightly. And as I said, then we'll open up the floor to your questions. Barbara, this is your first question to me. Um, in the exhibit, I saw that there are borders surrounding the, the pictures in the Crusader Bible, and the borders are written in three different languages. Uh, that seems to me to indicate an interesting story. And can you tell us how those borders came to be written in three different languages and how and where? Yes, you might have noticed when I had my slides up, I completely cropped out <laughs> the, um, the words that Barbara is asking about. And they do tell part of a fascinating story of the provenance of this manuscript. And um, I'll briefly recount those elements that touch on the uh, the language, the language issue. When the manuscript was made in the middle of the 13th century, as I mentioned, probably for Louis IX, and it's thought that indeed it originally had no, no words at all. Uh, Louis was very well educated and knew his Bible stories, and the theory is that he didn't need any explanations. However, um, by uh, about 50, 60 years later, in the early 14th century, the manuscript had wandered down to Italy, and the first set of inscriptions, Barbara, were added. We know they're Italian because of the style of the initials. And these are in Latin, so that's our next step, which is Latin inscriptions dating to the early 14th century. So then we have other inscriptions, which are in Persian. There. And this is the next part of the story, which is even <laughs> very funny and interesting. But um, by the early 17th century, the manuscript was in the possession of Cardinal Ber Bernard Magistrowski of Krakow. And there was a papal commission sent by Pope Clement VIII to take um, gifts to Shah Abbas, the king of Persia, to encourage him to be tolerant of Christians and intolerant of the Turks. 
And so uh, the cardinal thought that this would make a nice gift because it's a beautiful manuscript. And so it went off and actually was presented. We know the date of the presentation to the Shah in 1608. Of course, the Shah didn't know the Bible. And so he asked for inscriptions, the Persian inscriptions, to be added in the early 17th century so that he could know what's going on with the pictures. And actually, it's very interesting if you compare the uh, or original Latin to the Persian inscriptions, the Persians got things right that the Latin did not. <laughs> <laughs> then we hop to the 18th century, and we think that when Isfahan fell by the hand of the Afghans in 1722, the royal treasury and library was then sacked, and the manuscript fell into the hands of a Jew living in Isfahan, who, however, then added inscriptions in what are called Judean Persian inscriptions. So they're in, they're in Persian, but the letter forms are Hebrew. So that's the third level. So there's actually three levels and three different date times, so 14th, 17th, and 18th century. So they indeed tell us a lot about the provenance of the book. I'll just quickly add, uh, going forward to the 19th century, it then was uh, bought and owned by the famous vellomaniac Sir Thomas Phillips, who collected thousands of manuscripts, anything that was on vellum. He was very proud of this manuscript, and towards the end of his life, everybody who was anybody wanted to buy this, and nobody could, and the estate kept hold of it until in the early 19th century it actually was offered to Pierpont Morgan, our founder, in 1910 for 10,000 pounds. 10,000 pound, British pounds seems to be the going rate to get JP. He didn't buy it. We don't know. It could have been the price, but we're not sure. However, Bell Green saw it. And so J.P. dies in 1913, hop to 1917, she goes over to England, and the war's not even over yet, and she uh, makes an appointment with the heir's agent, and she got it offered to her again, same price, and she was so excited to buy this that actually she agreed to buy it without securing the permission of her boss, which was J.P. Morgan's son. She didn't want it let slip through the fingers again. <laughs> This is your, that's thank it. you. That's I'm, it. That's the next okay. question. Um, the Book of Ruth uh, ends with a genealogy which ends with King David. And I know that both the uh, artists of the Edwin Page and I decided to continue that genealogy. I did it by adding the last lines of Proverbs in Hebrew, Eshet Chayel, or a woman of valor, and the names of 27 biblical women of wisdom, virtue, and valor. But what did the artist do here in the Edwin Page? So I mentioned earlier that this is an iconographic type called the tree of Jesse. Jesse's not the easiest person to find in this tree. He's lying prone here, there's his feet, there's his stomach, and there's his head. And out of his stomach, or loins, grows the tree. And his first child, uh, his son, is David. So this is presumably David there, crowned with a beard. And then we have the sort of anonymous other descendants of David until we get to here. And here we have a scene of a, uh, a man sensing an, uh, an altar, and that's actually Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, who's not depicted in the tree, but he's in a scene that is cut off here, but is visible in the manuscript original in the exhibition. But more importantly is this figure here, which is the Virgin Mary, and she's flanked by two scenes. Here on the right is her marriage to Joseph. You can maybe see the two of them joining their right hands. And then after the marriage, the angel Gabriel comes and says, you have been chosen to be the son of God. Here is the dove of the Holy Spirit. And here's the fruit of that 
uh, announcement, which is Jesus Christ, who just in case you miss the dove there, he has another dove above his head. So the, in the Christian tradition, the, fla the final flowering of the tree of Jesse is the Savior Christ. This illumination is, is different from all the others. And uh, when I looked at it, I noticed that on the left, there's a picture of Jesus' descent from the cross and two biblical scenes uh, in between. And then it ends with Ruth and Naomi. So how are all these scenes related to each other? This manuscript opening here is uh, an example from uh, one of these texts of the Middle Ages of which I'm very fond. Uh, in Latin, they're called the Speculum Humani Salvationis, or the Mirror of Mankind's Salvation. And what these very interesting texts do is the medieval theologians would take the life of Christ moment by moment by moment and then search into the Old Testament or even some pagan text to find people, events, or things that they consider prefigurations, forewarnings of the events of the New Testament. So you're exactly right. The scene on the left is the deposition, Christ's body being taken down from the cross. However, what's very poetic, and I think very, really very touching in this, is that this importance of the scene is actually not Christ in his body, but the virgin and her sorrow. And it's her feelings that are being prefigured by three events from the Old Testament. The first of which is here, and that is Jacob being presented with this bloody coat of what he thinks is his dead son, Joseph. And so his sorrow at the time of thinking his son, Joseph, has died, um, is a prefiguration of the virgin's sorrow at her dead son. The next shows Adam and Eve holding the body of poor murdered Abel. And so the sorrow that these parents feel at the death of their son is interpreted as a prefiguration of the virgin's sorrow at the foot of the cross. And the final one is the scene of Naomi upon the return to Judea and at the city gates she's greeted by some of her friends or relatives that know her and they call her name Naomi and she says no don't call me Naomi which means happy but call me Mara which means miserable because I am the most miserable person who has lost her husband and her sons and so that sorrow of Naomi at the loss of three men in her life, two children and husband, is also thought to prefigure the loss of uh, the Virgin Mary's son. So all of them relate to the sorrow felt by a parent at the loss of a child. And I'm not a parent, but I understand that that is one of the most unbearable losses that a parent can feel. So, Barbara, I have a few questions for you. And one touches on the thistle, which you showed in your selection, and I think is one of the most striking images in the manuscript. You mentioned platinum, and uh, I'm correct in seeing that yes. it's also uh, lined with gold? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. If you haven't seen the thistle, you've got to see it. So that brings up, uh, to me, part of the medieval part of you, which is you're using foils. Uh, uh, mind you, gold and silver we use in the Middle Ages, but you've added to that repertoire platinum. Can you tell us more about your use of these foils? Well, um, really, illumination is all about light and brilliance. And it, that's created by attaching bits of precious metal leaf to the parchment pages and burnishing to a high shine so that the effect that you get when the pages are turned are flashes of light, brilliant, uh, just enlivens the page. And I think the best way for me to tell you how this is done, because it's rather complex, is to sh show you two short film clips. Um, and the first one will show you something about the use of 
the here gold foil uh, being attached to the pages. Gold leaf uh, comes supplied in, in what we call books. They're, they're small packets of uh, about 20, 25 leaves with a piece of tissue paper in between each leaf. It looks as if there are solid pieces of gold attached to the page. Actually, it's an optical illusion. And the gold leaf that's used for gilding is incredibly thin. Uh, it's so thin that it's almost weightless. The sheet of gold leaf is so thin that if you took it in your hands and rubbed it, it would vanish. In order to hold on to that piece of gold leaf, enable it to be cut into uh, shapes that I need to use to gild with, uh, I place it on a gilder's pad. Once the, the gold leaf has been cut into uh, shapes on the pad, you've got to get it from the pad to the uh, gesso that's, that's waiting for it. My preferred method is to use the very tip of my finger. The oils in my skin will hold the piece of leaf firmly in place, and it just hangs there as I transfer it from the pad to the gesso. Once the, the gold is, is firmly secured to the gesso, and once I have enough layers on so that I, I like the look of it, um, it has to be smooth, and that's called burnishing. And burnishing really is, is actually just smoothing and polishing it to a high shine. Well, I mentioned gesso in that film clip, and uh, gesso is just one of many methods of securely attaching the metal leaf to the parchment page. Uh, it happens to be the most time-consuming, but it also gives the most spectacular effects, and I love to use it. So let me show you how it's made and how it's done. Gesso is a material that's made of a combination of plaster, white lead, uh, some sort of glue, a little bit of sugar, and some bowl. Some materials are, are added to the mixture to help the illuminator uh, create this highly polished surface on the gold. Some materials are added to the mixture uh, as a glue, because that's actually what holds the gold leaf in place. After I paint the gesso into the areas that I wish to gild, I need to let it dry thoroughly. I go over it with a fine blade or even some sandpaper to even the surface, to scrape off any little bumps and marks that I may have left. I have to be certain that this surface is as smooth and as perfect as I can get it because what you have on the gesso surface is what you're going to see when it's gilded and polished. In order to glue the leaf to the gesso surface, I have to activate the glue that's in the mixture. I use a, a small tube made of a rolled up piece of paper to direct my breath exactly to the area that, that needs to be moistened. At that point, I have about three seconds to pick up a small piece of leaf and drop it onto the surface, press it down, and burnish it slightly. Barbara, I can't help but notice, and I think everyone notices, that um, you don't use a lot of figures in the, Bruce, in the Book of Ruth manuscript. And uh, the slide on the screen shows the largest, uh, which is the dramatic moment of Ruth and Naomi embracing. And I wondered, and, and even with them, we don't see their faces. I'm wondering if this um, avoidance of the human figure is part of a Jewish tradition of avoiding the depiction of the, of the human figure? Uh, there really is no Jewish religious prescription against using the, the human figure. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence from antiquity, but we do have the third century Dura Europa synagogue, 
which when excavated in the, in the last century, uh, it was found to be covered with paintings on all the walls of the synagogue of biblical scenes and portraits. So people were pictured, uh, come forward a bit in time to uh, Muslim Spain, and I have to say that artists were really influenced by the uh, customs of the community in which they lived. And so the creation of Hebrew manuscripts in Muslim Spain followed the Muslim tradition of only using geometric shapes, no figures in their Quran and other religious books. And many of the Hebrew manuscripts followed that tradition, not completely, they, they do include some figures, but mostly the illuminations were Islamic type carpet pages with Hebrew text or arches and geometric shapes. As you move north in Europe, the tradition changes and that was also determined by the local rabbinic authority, whatever they felt was acceptable. And here we have really the only other uh, illumination that I found uh, relating to the Book of Ruth and it's in the tripartite Mahsor from around 1300 in northern Germany. And there they uh, dealt with the idea of not showing human uh, pictures by substituting animal and bird's heads for the people. There's still another even more famous uh, illustration of that in the bird's head Haggadah, where every human figure has rather than a human face, a bird's head, and we know that they were Jews because the, the figure on the left is wearing a Jew's hat. Um, I have to say that on my part, it was a conscious decision not to retell this story, retell the words of the story with pictures, but uh, I felt there was so much interesting commentary that I would tell the story by adding the backstory, the commentary, wherever I could, except for the page where the visual was so iconic that I did include both Ruth and Naomi, where uh, Ruth says, entreat me not to leave thee, and makes the declaration that your God will be my God. Uh, but I left the viewer to people this book with whoever they thought Naomi would have resembled or Ruth would have resembled. I, I love the shoe, the sandal. It really jumps out of the book. And it's, um, it's, it also takes up a lot of space. It's a large image. Um, What's going on with the shoe? What's the shoe in this? What's, what's the role of the sandal in the story of Ruth? Well, it's a large image because it spawned a large amount of commentary on, not on the shoe itself, but the reason for the shoe. And the shoe, the sandal here, only appears in biblical text used this way it, once in the book of Ruth and the next time in the book of Deuteronomy, where it's used as a token for a situation where uh, a man has died and left no issue. His wife is widowed with no children. And there the text puts the obligation on his brother or the closest kin to marry that woman produce a child to carry the name of the deceased, to carry on that family line so that it would not die out in Israel. The Book of Ruth presents a strange hybrid. The text doesn't quite say that, but there's another uh, area of text in Leviticus that deals with what's happening in the Book of Ruth Naomi's land being sold and offered to the next of kin. And there it says, if your brother is, 
is impoverished, becomes poor enough to have to sell his possession, meaning his land, it's incumbent on the brother or the next closest kin to buy that land, to redeem the piece of land that's been sold so that it doesn't leave the family, it doesn't leave the tribe, it stays with them. So what you have in the book of Ruth is Boaz coming to the next in line. Boaz says, there is one before me, I will go to the gate and assemble the elders, but there's one who comes before me in choice here. And he offers the land, which he says is Naomi's. Naomi must sell it, and would you buy it? And he agrees. But then Boaz says, uh, and the land is also Ruth's. So if you're taking this land, you're taking the land and Ruth, and then the next in line, who's not named, declines. He says it will mar my inheritance. And Boaz then steps up and says, I'm buying the land, witness that I'm buying the land that belonged to Naomi, and I will marry Ruth. And he says to raise up the name of her deceased so that that line will continue. What I did here was to try and include both versions so that they, when the person who could read that text behind the shoe would see that it is the text in Leviticus about just a civil transaction, just exchanging the piece of land for a shoe. As it is said in the book of Ruth, this was the custom in former times, and I painted it in uh, sort of an archaic typeface to contrast with the, the main text of the Book of Ruth. And that's why you have this large sandal page, because I felt there was so much to say about it. So the, right, so that the Book of the Ruth's text is written in the beautiful calligraphy, solid black, yes. and the, the archaic gray calligraphy tells the non-Ruth text snippet part of the sandal, okay. The last item in the exhibition is the subject of my last question to you, which is this terrific binding. Uh, it's really a modern treasure binding that was designed by your husband, Rudy, and then features on the top cover these, uh, they're 24 karat gold letters, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about this binding? <laughs> well. Since, uh, since the book was done in a particular way, it needed a special kind of binding. And I felt, when I created this book, I wanted to reference two traditions. One tradition that comes from the Hebrew title of the book, which is Megillah Ruth, Scroll of Ruth. And that's how it was originally read. It's not read that way anymore. We read it in codex form as a book. And so what I wanted to do was to create a manuscript that would reference that scroll and yet be able to be read as a book. So I created an accordion fold where the pages are folded in on each other as a book, but the entire manuscript could be unfolded or unrolled as a scroll, uh, but unlike a scroll, this book can be read from both sides, from the English side and from the Hebrew side. And I think I'll uh, show you the Hebrew side first. And then Folded in the opposite direction is the English side. But so, you designed it so that the text block can actually come out of the binding, as we can see in the exhibition. And so that was my second sort of historical reference. 
when you have something like an accordion fold, it has to be bound uh, stably so that, and if I wanted to pull it out in either direction, it needed something that uh, was created in uh, Muslim Spain for both Muslim and Hebrew manuscripts, and that was to extend the covers into a box shape so that the book could be securely bound into it and the box opened, the manuscript read, and closed so that it kept the parchment stable and kept it protection, protected. But what I did here was to fold the manuscript, attach a separate piece of parchment both to the box and to the manuscript, and in a sort of origami type fold, that manuscript slips into the fold, and if you don't know what to unfold, it looks as if it's securely bound in, but you can take it out. Um, and what I did was also to reference uh, the Morgan's treasure binding, but in creating this treasure binding, um, the box is covered with something called shot silk, which is silk that's woven with two different colored threads so that when you look at the box, at one angle, it's purple, like royal purple to reference David, and at another angle, the two different colored threads, purple and orange, blend into the golden color of wheat. But I wasn't finished there, and uh, Joanna Rose did commission the letters for the uh, cover on the box, which say, your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. And an expert silversmith cut those letters out of a sheet of solid 24 karat gold, shaped them into letters, and uh, it has a very intricate fastening, but they're fastened permanently onto the box. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have now time to open up the floor, yes, to a few questions. In the back, the woman. So I, aside from being in awe of your artistry, I'm also in awe of your knowledge, and I have a two-part question. How long have you studied in this area, and when did you first begin your love of this? both history and manuscripts? Well, I, I can't say I've studied for a long time, but I've been interested in it all my life. Um, I think I always loved to come and see manuscripts at the Morgan and any other place that they were being displayed. I always had a love of, of research and the fascination with biblical texts, not exactly from a religious point of view, but as a text and as a study of, of the history of, of Judaica. So I think it's been a, a lifelong interest. Uh, I don't know if I can say anything else to enlighten that. It just has always been with me. Uh, gentleman there in the front row, almost. It's, it's Robert, isn't it? Hello, Robert. Welcome. What's your question? Well, um, sort of follows up on, on what was just asked. Did, did you go to art school to study art drawings, or, or did this all come? Did you teach yourself to do A lot of it. I would say most of it is self-taught. I, I always worked as an artist. I did not go to art school, but I always drew. So it's always been, for me, sort of catch up, be interested in a particular technique, and then figure out how to learn how to do it. And it was the same for manuscript illumination. Uh, I did take one class at a pigment dealer's in using the materials, but after that, it's just anything I could get my hands on to read, and a lot of playing with materials. And if I was successful in doing something, I would 
jot it down in a notebook, like an artist's recipe book. And uh, I do have five precious books on my shelf with all sorts of notes of how to do things. I think we have time for one more. The person in the center. Can you say a few words about working on parchment? What some of the challenges are and what happens if you make a mistake? <laughs> And also, is parchment and the same thing? Yes, it is. It is. I, they really are different. They should describe two different kinds of material, but they really don't. It, it's used interchangeably. So I'll, I'll speak to the easiest one first. It's wonderful to work on parchment. If you make a mistake, it's so easy to fix it. You just take a very sharp scalpel and say, ah, oh, what a pity, and scrape it all off and start all over again. And you can't do that with paper. Yeah. So that's the good part. Um, I love working on parchment. It's a very quirky material. It's different. Every, every corner of it, every single section of the same piece of parchment is different. And it behaves differently, and you have no idea what it's going to do until you work on it. It changes with the humidity. It expands, contracts, changes shape. And I find that really exciting. It's, it's very alive. And it's an absolutely beautiful surface to work on. I mean, you, you get colors that you don't get on paper. So I love working on it. Uh, the parchment that I use comes from England. There's one parchment maker there that's been in business, I think, for probably two and a half centuries. And it, they make the finest parchment I've ever seen. And uh, There's a dealer here that imports it. And when I'm working on a manuscript, I go out and select from whatever stock they have, and if it's not enough, they'll put it in another order and we'll see what the next batch brings until I have enough for a book. Thank you all very much for coming and enjoy the exhibition.